Well, good evening. Thank you for coming. Looking forward to the next three nights together as we study some of the Bible's most fascinating prophecies from the books of Revelation and Daniel and a few other places as well. Hopefully you have your study guide for tonight. It should look like this. If you're watching online, thank you for joining us. And you can find those on our website at pathwaytoparadise.org as well. I want to give you just a quick look ahead at our topics for tonight and the next two nights. Tonight, our topic is a planet in chaos. And we'll be looking at a lot of the things that are happening in our world today. What does the Bible say about that? What does that tell us about where we are in the stream of time? And uh, when is Jesus coming back? Well, we'll be looking at some of those questions. Tomorrow night, we'll be looking at the rise of Babylon. And we'll be diving into some of Revelation's uh, most central prophecies. Revelation chapter 13, chapter 17, uh, a few other places as well. So I hope that you can come back tomorrow night. Bring a friend as well as we look at those prophecies. And then Sunday night, we'll be looking at the topic marked or sealed. The book of Revelation talks about two kinds of marks that people can receive, either the mark of the beast, which we don't want to have, or the seal of God, which we do want to have. And so we're going to be taking an in-depth look at what the Bible really says about the mark of the beast. We'll be seeing a lot of good news connected with that as well. But tonight, our topic is a planet in chaos. How many of you would agree that our planet is in a condition of chaos right now? Yeah, there's, there's many hands going up and uh, you know, life on this earth has always involved chaos and trouble and so forth. It seems to be part of our world as it is right now. But over the last several months, the last couple of years, uh, the chaos scale has seemed to greatly increase, hasn't it? And a lot of people are wondering why is all of this happening? Um, what is happening next? Where is our planet headed? We're going to be looking at those questions tonight. We're going to see what the Bible says about where we are in this stream of time. There've been a lot of news stories talking about all of the chaos that our world has been wrapped in over these last several months. So we see COVID chaos and that's still going on, isn't it? That uh, has not uh, left us yet. Some people, uh, and I have to agree sometimes we wonder, is it ever going to go away? We'll have to see. We have pandemic threatens to unleash economic chaos. And that certainly has been part of the chaos circling our world. Hasn't it? Uh, the, the economy Then we have the supply chain chaos is already hitting global growth and it's about to get worse. Maybe you've, maybe you've heard just in recent weeks, the reports of dozens, even hundreds of container ships off the coast of California, um, not able to get into port or no reason to get into port because there's nobody to unload the ships. And what is that going to do to all of the, uh, the products that uh, we're used to having on the shelves here? Big questions, supply chain chaos. Here's a story. New York declares state of emergency as vaccine mandate chaos looms. We're seeing these kind of headlines all over the place, aren't we? Uh, as these mandates keep rolling out. Now, last year we had other kinds of chaos. We had a lot of civil unrest, didn't we? And so we saw absolute chaos in Minneapolis as protests grow across the United States. And these protests, uh, as you remember, they started there in Minneapolis, but they quickly spread to many other cities and many other countries of the world, didn't they? Here we have Chicago protests, restrictions imposed after chaotic night of unrest. And just one example from overseas, this was from France, Macron chaos, Riots erupt on streets of Paris in fourth night of brutal unrest in France. I liked this headline, a cacophony of chaos. Why the U S election outcome is more uncertain than ever. Uh, now, obviously that was about a year ago, our elections last year, but that was a pretty chaotic election. wasn't it? It makes you wonder what will the next round of elections be like? Will it be any better or will it be worse? And then we have the climate and climate change. So climate change, loss of bumblebees driven by climate chaos. Another example, climate chaos, extreme heat, wildfires, and record setting storms suggest a frightening future is already here. Now, as we're meeting tonight, um, world leaders for many of the nation, uh, world's most powerful nations are gathering in Scotland 
to begin their deliberations or actually they're just finishing their deliberations at the COP26 meetings. How can we tackle climate change? And I thought it was ironic there right where they were meeting. There was a tornado warning as strong winds tear down trees and cause travel chaos for COP26 climate delegates. And I'm sure that uh, added a lot of impetus to their discussions. Well, all of this leads us to a question, doesn't it? Why does chaos exist? And we're going to turn to the Bible as we begin looking for answers. Now I'm using the black study Bible. Uh, these were offered on the table as you came in tonight. If you didn't have a Bible, hopefully you have one of these and uh, I'll be using that one and I'll let you know the page numbers. Uh, if you didn't get one of those, hopefully that means you have your own Bible, which is even better. And um, either way, we'll be studying the word of God as we look at these things. So in your study guide, question number one tonight, why does chaos exist? It's a good question, isn't it? And we're going to go to the very beginning of the Bible story in Genesis chapter one. Now, um, if you need me to tell you the page number, it's page number one. <laughs> so here we go. This is the very first thing the Bible begins to tell us. There are many ways that God could have uh, begun the story of the Bible. Lots of truths or doctrines or prophecies or stories, even songs. There's lots of songs in the Bible. God could have started the Bible in many different ways, but he chose to begin the Bible by telling us this in Genesis chapter one, verses one and two. It's also on the screen in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the very first thing that the Bible tells us is that God is our creator. And this is a bedrock principle that runs throughout the entire Bible, through the entire old Testament, through the entire new Testament, all the way down to the closing verses of revelation. The fact that God is the creator of life. He is the creator of this world. It, it, it runs like a golden thread through all of scripture. And we'll see as we continue through our prophecy meetings this weekend, there is a reason that God begins scripture. There's a reason he begins the Bible by telling us that he is the creator absolute bedrock principle for us to understand and remember. Now let's keep reading verse number two. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here we have a short description or a brief description of what the earth was like before be, uh, God begins his work of creation. And you can see my underlined words there. It was without form. When you go back to the original Hebrew, that literally means confusion or wasteland or a place of chaos. This world was a chaotic mess or a swirling mess of chaotic water. However you want to think of that before God begins his work of creation. And as Genesis chapter one progresses, we see that on day one, God says, let there be light on day two. God says, let the waters be separated from the waters above the firmament and below the firmament. So he creates the atmosphere and the, these waters are separated on day three. God creates dry land and then he creates the vegetation, the, the grass and the flowers and the trees. They just appear and they, they blossom and they blood or <laughs> they bud and they, they, they bear fruit. That's day three on day. Number four of creation. God again speaks. And this time the sun and the moon and the stars appear on day five. God speaks again and the fish begin swimming in the waters and the birds begin flying in the air. And God is bring, bringing order out of chaos, isn't he? This is the, one of the fundamental messages here of Genesis chapter one. God tells us first that he is a God that brings order out of chaos. That's good news, isn't it? That's really good news. Uh, that, uh, that is a God that we can trust. It's a God that we can serve. It's a God that we can love because he brings order out of chaos. As we continue reading the first chapters of Genesis, we discover very quickly that chaos comes as a result of sin, not as a result of God's creation, the way he intended this world, but because of sin. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter three. It's just one page turn in uh, our black study Bibles. And at the beginning of Genesis chapter three, we have a, 
the story of how sin entered this world. Satan or the devil takes the form of a serpent or he possesses a serpent, a snake, and he appears to Eve there in the tree. Maybe you remember the story and he begins questioning her. Did God really say you couldn't eat of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And Eve begins to converse with the snake. And eventually Eve makes a horrible decision, doesn't she? She decides to trust the serpent rather than to trust God and obey God. Let's read the story here. Genesis chapter three, verse six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. So Adam and Eve, the first two people uh, God created here on this planet, they rebel against God. They disobey him. And the moment they do moral chaos begins to enter into this world. And we've been dealing with it ever since. Now, other kinds of chaos quickly resulted. Verse eight goes on to tell us, and we'll just read it. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, up until this moment, whatever amount of time had elapsed from their creation until this moment when they disobeyed God, Adam and Eve had had a a perfect communion with God, unbroken communion with God. They were joyful and excited when God appeared in that garden of Eden to talk with them. But not on this day. On this night, they were terrified. They were fearful. And we see spiritual chaos now, a disconnect between humanity and God as a result of sin, as a result of disobedience. Social chaos also came very quickly. God asked Adam, why are you hiding? What did you do? And instead of admitting his guilt, Adam points at Eve and says, it's her fault. And we've been playing that game ever since, haven't we? It's not my fault. I didn't do it. The devil made me do it. Whatever. She made me do it. God asks Eve, why did you do this? Why did you disobey? And she points at the serpent and said, he made me do it. And so we have moral or or we have social chaos as well. And then as God is explaining to Adam and Eve and also to the serpent, the results of what has happened, we see that there is also physical and environmental chaos that comes as a result of sin. Read with me verse 17 of Genesis chapter three. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow. Shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So there are some effects in the environment in the earth itself. God goes on in verse 18 and he says, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In other words, this planet was not going to be from that point forward, the way God intended it. And as we sit here thousands of years after this story takes place, we can say, yep, we're still dealing with all of these kinds of chaos, moral chaos, spiritual chaos, social chaos, and physical and environmental chaos chaos. What does the Bible say about our day right now? The time in which we live, it talks about chaos as well. Let's turn to the very back of the Bible. This is the book of revelation. And we'll just look at a few verses here from revelation chapter 18. So we have taken a snapshot from the very beginning of this world's history. And now we're looking at the very end of this world's history. And we're going to see that the Bible predicts Uh, an avalanche of chaos at the very end of time. Now, again, if you're in the black seminar Bible, this is page 738, just a page or two from the end of the book of revelation. We'll also have these verses on the screen. Verse one says, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now we're going to study much more in depth about Babylon tomorrow night. So I hope you'll come tomorrow night and again, bring a friend. These are messages that you don't want to miss and you don't want your friends and loved ones um, to miss these messages either. Powerful prophecies from the Bible for us today. In the book of Revelation, Babylon represents 
uh, an end time unification of humanity that is opposed to God and rebels against God. And there are, uh, are several parts to this unification of humanity. As we'll see, there's economic and political and religious and spiritual aspects to this Babylonian power that rules the world for a short time, just before Jesus Christ comes back. That's what this angel is warning about. And he's saying it's fallen right here is spiritual and moral chaos. And the angel goes on in verse three and he says, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the Kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now notice the different aspects of society and life on earth that are mentioned in this verse. We have uh, nations and the Kings of the earth. This refers to those political powers and entities, doesn't it? It also mentions the merchants of the earth being waxed rich. And as this angel continues his message, he warns that Babylon is about to fall. Verse four, he says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. You know, God cares about us, cares about you, cares about your family. He wants the best for the people he has created. He sent his son to die for us. And he doesn't want people to be wrapped up and engulfed in chaos without any idea of how to move forward in life or to experience something better. And so it's in mercy and grace that God calls people out of this Babylonian mess, this Babylonian chaos, because God knows a time is coming when everything on this earth is going to collapse in a big chaotic rubble heap. And that happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So here's the call. Come out, stand apart, live your life differently than the rest of the world is living it. And the invitation is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, to build your life on the Bible and the word of God. And God's promise is that when we do that, our lives will not fall to the chaos around us. We can stand firm with Jesus Christ. Now, as Revelation chapter 18 continues, it begins to describe all these different areas of society, these different aspects of Babylon that begin to fall apart and to disintegrate into chaos. So just briefly, let's look at a few of those verses in verse nine and 10. We see the political chaos and the Kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Uh, they will stand afar off for fear of her torment saying, alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city for in one hour is thy judgment come. This chaos, political chaos will happen quickly in one hour as the Bible puts it. We also see there will be economic chaos and collapse. Look at the very next verse, verse 11. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. So here we have economic chaos. Uh, that's going to impact the standard of living. Look at the next verse, verse 12, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble. And it keeps going and going all these things that make life comfortable and enjoyable and even luxurious, that standard of living, it's going to collapse as well. It will fall to chaos. The food supply. We also see, look at verse 13, cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat. All of these things fall to the chaos tornado as well. This is going to be a permanent, permanent uh, collapse. When we look at verse 14, it says in the fruits that thy soul lust, lusted after are departed from thee and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more at all. Friends, the Bible encourages us. It challenges us to place our affections and our treasures, not here on earth, not, uh, not on the things of this world, but in something better. And that something better is Jesus Christ. You know, he has a home prepared for us that will never fade away. It will never crumble. It will never disintegrate or fall into chaos. And he's inviting you to be part of that better place. And it's our privilege to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. I accept you as my savior. I surrender my life to you. 
I want to live in a better place and I want to live with you. What a promise. Finally, let's look at one more example. Verse 22, even entertainment. That's a big thing in the world today. All kinds of entertainment ways to distract our minds from what's going on around us. The entertainment will fall in chaos as Babylon collapses. Look at verse 22 and the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and of trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. All of these forms of entertainment will also fall to collapse. Now it's interesting last year, Hulk Hogan, you've heard of him, right? He made an interesting statement and he put it out on his Twitter account. And I'll have to say, I've never quoted Hulk Hogan before in a prophecy message or a sermon, but I found what he wrote very interesting. Here's what he said in three short months, just like he did with the plagues of Egypt. God has taken away everything we worship. God said, you want to worship athletes? I will shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I'll shut down civic centers. You want to worship actors? I will shut down theaters. You want to worship money? I will shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me. I will make it where you can't go to church. Interesting perspective, isn't it? And there's a lot of truth in there. All of these things that have distracted us in our lives. Uh, a lot of it has been shut down. A lot of it has disappeared. Some of it may never come back. Chaos everywhere. Well, friends, let's go back to the Bible. How will earth's chaos end? Here's question number two tonight. How will earth's chaos end? And now we're going to look at some things that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24. So let's go there. Jesus said in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. Jesus is describing his return, his second coming, the second advent here. And what a wonderful day that will be. He goes on in verse 31 and he says, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. So here's a promise from Jesus, the promise of his return. Friends, this is one of the most repeated promises in the Bible. About one in every 25 verses of the new Testament deals in some way with the second coming of Jesus Christ. So it's important to God, isn't it? He wants us to understand these things. We're going to look briefly at what the second coming will be like, according to the Bible. So let's turn to revelation chapter one. Uh, we'll also have it on the screen here. Revelation chapter one and verse seven, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also, which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So the second coming of Jesus is going to be something uh, very visible. You know, in other verses, he says it will be like the lightning flashing from one end of the sky to the other. Um, you're not going to miss it. In fact, it's going to be so bright that it's going to wake up the dead. Have you ever been asleep at night and a particularly bright flash of lightning streaks across your window? You wake up, don't you? Well, uh, the Bible describes death as a sleep. And at the second coming, when the glory of Jesus and God come back, uh, and, and, and flood this world. It's going to be so bright that it wakes up the dead. The apostle Paul writes in first Thessalonians chapter four, beginning in verse 16, he says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So this is not going to be some secret, uh, quiet event, right? Um, when Jesus comes to take his people home with him, this is a very public event very dramatic event. Every eye will see and every ear will hear. And uh, I'm a trumpet player. I've always liked this verse because and no offense, but Jesus does not come back with the oboe, does he? Or he doesn't come back with a violin. Why is that? He comes back with the last trump. That's because trumpets are very loud instruments. Historically, they've been used as signals for war or alarm or to uh, guide and direct the troops, even during battle. 
trumpet is a loud instrument. Years ago, one of my trumpet teachers sent me a YouTube video of him playing a solo. And he was standing in the middle of a large uh, civic orchestra or civic band. And he wanted me to know that the rest of the ensemble had microphones, but he did not. And as I listened to the video, it was pretty impressive. He was playing big and loud and high, and you could hear that trumpet soaring out above all of the other instruments, even without a microphone. And uh, there's a reason that God comes back and Jesus comes back with a trumpet. It's a loud instrument. And the point is that this is not a quiet event. It's visible and it's loud. What else happens? Verse 17 goes on. Then we, which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Friends, when Jesus comes back, he does not walk on this earth. He calls his people up to meet him in the clouds of glory. And uh, there's a reason Jesus says that because he warns in other places that there will be false Christs, uh, false messiahs who will come and claim to be Jesus coming back the second time, but they will be walking on the ground. And he says, if someone says that the Messiah has come and he's out here in the desert or maybe hidden in a closet somewhere, don't go, don't even look. I had a friend uh, years ago who used to say, if it's on CNN and someone says, wow, you've got to see this. I won't even watch it on TV because I might get deceived through the television. Imagine that. And I thought that was good advice. So Jesus says, don't be deceived. I've told you what my second coming is going to be like. It's going to be visible by everybody. It's going to be heard by everybody. The dead in Christ will rise. And together with those living saints, those who are ready for Christ's return, they will join Christ in the air. Which brings us to question number three. How near is Christ's return? Are we getting closer? How close are we? Now, I just want to say... From the outset here, we are not going to be setting any dates. A lot of people have tried that. And Jesus was very clear that we can't know the exact day or hour. But Jesus did say this in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 32. He said, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Now, in our previous house, we had a greenhouse and I was experimenting with a fig tree And it grew big enough to start bearing figs. And I understand this verse a lot better now. A fig tree is unique in that it, uh, when it's coming out of dormancy, it puts out its figs first and then the leaves follow. So when you see a fig tree with leaves, uh, you can assume, or you should be able to assume safely that the fruit is already there. The fruit is ready. And this is what Jesus is saying. You know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So Jesus expects us. He expects Christians. He expects those who have a Bible and read the Bible and believe the Bible to be able to understand when his coming is near. And he says all these things. Well, what is he referring to? Let's go backward in this chapter of Matthew 24 and look a little bit more closely at what Jesus is talking about. What are these signs that he is referring to that are way marks that let us know that his return is near. Verse three of the same chapter. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man and deceive you for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. Jesus goes on to describe many of the signs that will precede his coming. But the very first thing that he says, the most important point that he wants his disciples to understand is that spiritual deception will be the most uh, dangerous thing. And one of the biggest signs of his second coming that it's drawing near. Don't be deceived. Jesus said now warnings for us today too, isn't it? He doesn't want us to be deceived. That's why he tells us these things in the Bible. Now let's keep reading. Jesus goes on in verse six and he says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. That means many places. 
And then he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. You know, sometimes people look at this passage or other similar passages in the Bible and they say, well, but yeah, there's always been war. And that's true. There's always been war in this world. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been famines. There's always been all of these things. And that's true. Ever since sin entered this world, there has always been chaos. But Jesus says something very important, very significant in verse eight. Let's read that again. He says, all of these things, all of these signs are the beginning of sorrows. Now in the original Greek, which Jesus was speaking, that word sorrows literally means birth pains. And that throws a whole new light on it. You know, when a woman goes into labor and I've watched my wife do it four times. Now we have been blessed with four children. And each time as labor started, those birth pains, those contractions started pretty far apart and fairly mild. But you know what happens as that baby and that mommy approach the moment of delivery. Those contractions get closer together in frequency and more intense in strength. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. All of these signs, uh, signs in nature and the environment, signs in politics and religion, signs in the economy, Signs in society and culture, all of these things, the chaos that we see will increase and will become more frequent as his return approaches. So we have some homework to do in the next few minutes here. We're going to look at some of these signs that Jesus talks about, and we're going to ask a simple question. Are these things that we are told will happen? Are they happening more frequently? Are they happening with greater intensity as we approach the second coming of Jesus Christ? Now, tonight we're going to focus on a couple of the areas that Jesus talks about. We're going to focus on nature and the environment and um, largely that, but also a few other things. Tomorrow night, we're going to focus largely on politics and religion. Uh, We're also going to look at economics tonight. So we'll be touching on some of these things as we continue our study uh, tomorrow night and even on Sunday night. So let's, let's look at here. One of the things that Jesus mentions is famine. 9.1 million people die every year in the world today of famine. If you do the math, that's about 25,000 deaths every single day or 17 deaths every single minute. And we've been meeting now for about 30 minutes and uh, you can do the math. That's a lot of people that have died somewhere in the world. Just since we've been sitting here in this nice, comfortable church, simply because they did not have enough food. Um, we know famine is a big problem. Interesting story here from Armstrong economics. They said the approaching famine, there is a serious risk of famine from 2020 onward. Our bifurcation models are reflecting also a gap in time between 2020 and 2031, suggesting a trend appears to last for that period of time. Now this is a serious problem. And the food supply has been under attack for quite a while now. During the past 100 years, 94% of the world's edible seed varieties have vanished. They're gone. They've gone extinct, essentially. That means we only have 6% of the variety of food available that we used to have. Today, 75% of the world's food comes from only 12 plants and five animal species. So we talk about a, a balanced diet Uh, that's getting harder and harder to do. What happens if one or more of these 12 plants or five animal species gets hit with a disease? Wouldn't be good, would it? This is another thing Jesus mentions and the Bible mentions is pestilence. Major disease outbreaks have increased from around 800 between 1980 to 1985 to nearly 3,200 between 2005 and 2009. And obviously those are kind of old statistics too. We're a decade past that. We're dealing with a major outbreak right now, aren't we? COVID-19, and it still has the world in its grips. Major disease outbreaks since the year 2000. We can just go back in our memory and think about some of these things. The West Nile virus, anthrax, uh, another SARS, uh, or um, yeah, another SARS type of respiratory illness in 2003, the SARS-CoV. There's mumps, there's E. coli and salmonella, uh, the H1N1 virus in 2009, whooping cough made a comeback in 2012, 
MERS CoV, uh, Ebola, Zika virus, and of course, COVID-19, which we are continuing to deal with. So is pestilence getting better or worse in our world? It's like those birth pains, right? It, they seem to be increasing in frequency and intensity as we move forward in time. Disease cases from fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. I found this one interesting. I don't know if you can read the small type there, but on the left side, that first graph is the year 2004. And these are um, disease reported disease cases from fleas, ticks, or mosquitoes have risen from about 25,000 in 2004 to nearly 100,000 a year in 2016. And if my backyard is any indication, uh, it's even worse now. <laughs> The, the ticks were pretty bad this past year. And I think many of us would agree to that. It's not getting better, is it? Uh, maybe you heard last year about the locust plagues that were sweeping through much of the Middle East and Africa. This story from NPR asks, locusts are a plague of biblical scope in 2020. Why? And what are they exactly? If the 2020 version of these marauders stays steady on its warpath, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization says desert locusts can pose a threat to the livelihoods of 10% of the world's population. Another news story described it this way as a living nightmare, defeating the locust plague of 2020. They are unpredictable. There is no real warning, but when they invade, they descend as an army of billions. In the darkness, the vicious predators feast on anything green and within hours, any vegetation in its path is gone. This apocalyptic image is not a bad dream, but the current reality, a worldwide locust upsurge is hitting countries around the globe with East Africa and the Horn of Africa, seeing the worst outbreak in decades, destroying hectares of farmland and putting millions at risk of hunger and famine. Pretty bad plagues of locusts going on there. What about natural disasters? Jesus also mentions things like earthquakes. What's happening with earthquakes? Here's another graph, major earthquakes since the year 1920. And um, this was from the United States Geological Surveys website. So in the 1920s, there were around 35 of these major earthquakes. You can see what happens as the decades go on in the 2010s, which we just finished. There were about 140 of these major earthquakes and the graph is definitely that trend is going upward, just like birth pains. Here's another earthquake um, comparison going back centuries, not just decades. So in the 1500s, there was uh, one or two earthquakes that were 8.5 or greater in magnitude in the 1600s. It jumped to three or four. You can see the 17s and 1800s hovered around 10 of these major earthquakes. Even the 1900s, there was uh, maybe 11 or 12. But what happened since the year 2000? Well, the yellow part of that last bar graph shows what has been recorded so far this century. There have been six of them already. And then the lighter part of that bar graph just extrapolates that. If we continue at that same rate for the next 80 years, there will be over 30 of these tremendous earthquakes of 8.5 or greater in magnitude. The hurricane season last year was so active that it exhausted the regular list of storm names. The Greek alphabet was used for only the second time on record. Last year's hurricane season broke many records. 22 of 25 storms had the earliest formation date ever. Nine mainland U.S. landfalls tied the year 1916 for the record. It had the most named storms in September on record. Three storms formed in a single day, also tying a record. And it was only the second time the Atlantic had five or more tropical cyclones at one time. Any of you remember seeing the satellite images of those cyclones uh, or hurricanes lined up at the same time? It was amazing to see them. They looked uh, like cars on a street going somewhere. Uh, pretty amazing. Now, things like hurricanes cause damage and they cost a lot of money. So what have we in the United States here had to pay over the last several years or decades as we recover from these mega natural disasters? Well, it's interesting. In the 1980s, you can see uh, the number of billion dollar disasters in terms of insurance claims. 
uh, has risen from about 30 in the 1980s to over 100. Uh, and that was in the 2010s. And now we have started a new decade as well. What about the cost of those disasters? This is in, uh, adjusted for inflation. We go back to the 1980s and we see a tremendous increase in cost, again, adjusted for inflation uh, to almost a trillion dollars in the 2010s. Uh, these disasters are getting more and more deadly. And they're not just deadly and destructive for us. They're also deadly and destructive for animals. Perhaps you've heard of the mass animal deaths that have been taking place now really for years all around the world. And just uh, huge numbers of animals will show up dead. Many times they're fish or other sea creatures. Sometimes birds will fall out of the sky, but it's been bigger animals as well. Um, elephants that they just find dead. Here were some whale bones uh, that just showed up on the beach between 1995 and 2018, a sixth of marine mammal species have suffered a mass die off caused by an infectious disease. That's um, a lot of animals, friends. Uh, last year, maybe you heard uh, of this disaster over in Siberia, 95% of marine life on the seafloor killed in the Kamchatka eco disaster scientists say. Nearly all seafloor dwelling life and pollution hit waters off Russia's Pacific coast and the Kamchatka region has been wiped out in an unexplained mass death of marine animals, scientists told the region's governor on Tuesday. Now that was last year. Uh, here are some of the most recent ones that have been taking place. And you can find, the, there are many websites that list these disasters and keep track of them. And it's not hard to find on the internet. What happened just last month in October, 2021 mass animal death events, October one, 7,000 dead seabirds found washed up along the coast in Crimea, October two, thousands of dead fish wash up in El Cayo de Bajarona, Dominican Republic. On the fourth, there was a mass die off of fish that washed up in Spain on October four, thousands of dead salmon washed up in Canada. On October 14, hundreds of dead migratory birds in Australia. 50 dead whales also that same day in Iceland. The next day, mass die off of fish in China. October 16, thousands of dead fish wash up on beaches in India. On the 20th, thousands of seabirds dying in the Western Cape. Uh, the very next day, thousands of dead fish wash up on a beach in England. These are just a few. There have been many, many more of these events taking place. Here's one closer to home, Kansas city. Just a few weeks ago, over 50,000 uh, fish died during a fish kill at brush Creek, right there in the middle of Kansas city. Now, why are all of these animals passing away in mass quantities? Why these mass death events? The Bible gives us an answer. Hosea chapter four, verse one says, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. It's a spiritual problem, isn't it? Humanity is slipping further and further away from God. And what are some of the results of that? Hosea goes on by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery. They break out and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn. And everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Friends, there's our answer. The Bible explains it for us. The earth itself, in fact, the New Testament tells us that creation is groaning in expectation of Christ's return when he puts all of this pain and misery and chaos to an end. The animals and the rest of this planet is, is waxing old. And these events are happening because sin is getting worse and worse and worse. Now Jesus also says in Luke chapter 21, here's another sign of his second coming. Verse 25, he says, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. Now that original Greek word that Jesus used literally means to be without resources or to be in straits. In other words, economic problems. And uh, we don't even have to look at any news stories or bar charts or graphs to know that the economy is not getting better here on earth. But <clears throat> here's the graph. Global debts have soared during the pandemic. So in 2013, 
That's where the graph starts. You can see was, there was a gradual rise in global debt, but then in 2020, it just skyrockets and it uh, uh, increases from about $320 trillion globally to over $360 trillion. And our global debt now is near 300 trillion. The pandemic fuels a global debt tsunami. Governments and companies took on 15 trillion more in borrowing in the first nine months of 2020, says the IIF. Let's end on some good news. Jesus gives one final sign that will be an unmistakable indicator that his coming is near. Again, it's found in Matthew chapter 24. And he says in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Yes, it's true. All these bad things have always been here in the world, but Jesus says, hold on. Here is one final sign that will let you know how close I am. And that is that the gospel will go to the entire world. So let's look briefly. What is happening in two of the world's most difficult places to preach about Jesus? and to share Christianity, the countries of Iran and China. What's happening over there? This is on Fox news. Iran has the world's fastest growing church, despite no buildings. And it is mostly led by women. And these gentlemen were sharing their documentary about this amazing phenomenon, this growth of Christianity in Iran. According to a new survey of 50,000 Iranians, 1.5% identified as Christian extrapolating over Iran's population of approximately 50 million literate adults yields at least 750,000 believers. Now, admittedly, that's a small percentage of the population in Iran, but it's tremendous growth given the situation and the circumstances there. What about China? It's very fascinating things happening in China as well. By now it has become clear that there are more practicing Catholics in China than in Italy and more practicing Protestants than all of Europe. If this growth continues at the current rate in less than two decades, China will become the largest Christian country in the world. Now, when I read that, my jaw almost dropped to the floor. I thought, wow, that's incredible. Of course, China has the most people of any country in the world. So there is the effect of sheer numbers, but still, this is amazing. In an atheistic communist country like China, Christianity is exploding. Let's keep reading. This would have vital consequences for China and the global community. By the year 2030, it is very likely that there will be more Protestants in China than all Christians combined in the United States. Is this sign being fulfilled friends? What Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And then the end will come. What would lead millions of Iranians and Chinese to an accept an outlawed religion, or at least one that is greatly uh, suppressed. What would lead so many of these people to take a risk that can mean social exclusion, persecution, and death. It can only be the love of Jesus friends. And that same love, that same relationship that they are discovering is available to you. It's available to us here today, tonight. And as we go out of here, Jesus wants that relationship with each one of us. And he promises that we can have it. All we have to do is say, yes, Lord, I believe that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ to die for my sins. I accept him as my savior. I'm tired of trying to figure out this chaotic thing called life on my own. I need your help. I must have you to help me. And you know what? When we say that prayer, when we pray that prayer and when we claim God's promise to hear it and to answer it, God works the miracles just like he's working miracles in Iran and China and all around the world. He can work a miracle in your life. And he can pull your life out of chaos and plant it on something firm. And that is Jesus Christ and his word. Shortly before his arrest, Jesus said in John 14, 29, now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Jesus wants you to believe that he's coming soon, that he loves you, that he has something better prepared for you. And so he gives us all of these prophecies that we might believe. Question four, how should we be living now in light of all of this? We'll go back to Matthew 24. 
And Jesus says, beginning in verse 43, but know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not the son of man. Comes. So we need to be ready, but how do we be ready? Well, the Bible tells us that as well. In Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse six, we read this. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea, and the fountains of waters. Now a lot packed into these two verses, friends. How can we be ready? First of all, we accept Jesus as our sacrifice as our savior and as our Lord. That's the everlasting gospel. He paid the price for sin so that you and I don't have to. And he exchanges his life for ours. When we accept him as our savior, we also see that we're supposed to fear God and give glory to him. That simply means that in the way we live our life, the things that we do, the things that we say, the places we go, the influence that we have, we should try to do it for God's glory and not for ourselves. Then he also, this angel also says the hour of his judgment is come, you know, before Jesus comes back, there's a judgment that takes place. And, um, as we live through this judgment hour, you know, if we realize we're in an hour of judgment, we live our lives a little differently. I don't know if you've ever stood in front of a judge before I have once it was minor. My license plate had been covered with one of those black plastic rings on the license plate. It was covered a little too much. And even for something minor like that, I put on my best suit. In fact, I think it was this one. And uh, I, you know, rehearsed what I would say. And as I stood in front of that judge, I said, yes, ma'am, I promise you it's been taken care of and it won't be a problem again. She said, good, get out of here. God wants us to live differently because we are living in an hour of judgment. And finally worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters going all the way back to Genesis chapter one, God is saying, please remember that I created you. You're not an accident. You're not a, a product of chance. Your life is not destined to be chaos forever because the same God that brought order out of chaos at creation promises to bring order out of the chaos in this world and in your life. So worship God who created everything. Question five, what does Jesus promise to give us beautiful promise here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Are you glad we have a savior like that? Whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. Perhaps you remember this story. It's been a few decades ago. Now, baby Jessica, 18 month old girl fell into an eight inch well in Midland, Texas. This happened in 1987. And uh, if you remember the news coverage, it captured the nation's attention for several days. As the question was asked, can this baby girl be rescued 22 feet below the surface? with one leg up above her head and the other leg below her in this eight inch well pipe, local emergency crews tried everything they could. Finally, they drilled a second hole close to that well. And as they got down to her depth, they bored across to reach her. And then they searched for someone, the right size with the right agility and the right bravery, willing to risk themselves to go down and rescue baby Jessica. Paramedic, paramedic Robert O'Donnell made his way down the shaft, picked up baby Jessica and together they were lifted up to safety and carried out of that. Well, 58 hours later, almost dead, but not quite friends. We have a savior who came down from above to rescue us in an impossible situation. This thing called sin, completely impossible for us to save ourselves from. We are just as hopeless as baby Jessica was in that well. 
Now the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And it also says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Friends, baby Jessica can no more get out of that well than we can get out of the penalty of sin ourselves. There is only one hope and that is in a savior, Jesus Christ, who came down to our level, who became human. He mixed divinity with humanity. He picked us up and he didn't leave us there where he found us. What an amazing thing about God. Yes, he will meet us wherever we are at. There are no requirements to come to God. We simply need to say, God, help me. I need your help. I believe in you. And he will reach down and he will pick us up. But God loves us too much to leave us where he finds us. And so just like baby Jessica was lifted back up out of that death trap and given new life, another chance on life. Jesus came down to this earth and he lifted up humanity. He paid that price for sin so that we don't have to. And now he is promising us better life, a new life, an eternal life with him. If we will just say, yes, Jesus, I trust in you. You should have some response cards. I invite you to take that right now. And over the next few minutes as the piano plays, to give your response to tonight's message. Number one, I understand the message. It's clear. It's biblical. I understand the message. If that's clear, if that's your response, please just check number one there. The second response says, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior and, and accept what he has done for me. If that's your response, please check it right there. And the third line says, if I have any, I have a question or I'd like to talk with the speaker or somebody else. If that's your response, just mark that there and we'll make sure that we get in touch with you. Friends, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we have seen a picture of what God is doing, but we're going to see a clearer picture emerge as we continue the next two nights. So I pray that you will uh, be able to come and join us tomorrow night as we look at our topic, the rise of Babylon. Thank you. God bless and good night.